code generation. And this is a very big room, so um, I'm glad you all could come. You're, you're plenty, but I didn't expect um, this to fill up anyways. However, um, you fortunately understood this. Runtime code generation sounds very esoteric, but it is a very present concept in the Java space. And what I'm trying today is to, uh, first of all, explain to you what runtime code generation is, uh, why it is so common in Java, what you can achieve with it, and based on this knowledge uh, afterwards, I'll try to explain to you how to achieve it. Um, runtime code generation, to many people, it's maybe not so obvious, but uh, after the session, I'm sure you will all understand um, yeah, wh what it is all about. I'm writing a library, which is called ByteBody. Uh, you might have heard of it. Um, you, there's a good chance it's on your class pass somehow. Um, since it's used by a bunch of libraries, it's used by Hibernate, it's used by Mokido, and many others. And yeah, so basically, also a goal of the session is that maybe you can implement libraries like that yourself. But let's just look at a, at a small use case. I hope you can see that. Yeah, it's pretty big. Let's say you want to implement um, a, a library that is a small security framework. And if you have used Spring Security, for example, then this is not so far off of what Spring Security is actually doing. So let's say we have this class, which is just a holder for a string, which is the user that is currently logged in, which by default is anonymous. And then we have an annotation where we um, basically specify the user that can invoke a certain method. And let's say you have a service class in your application that is only supposed to be invoked by the administrator of the application. So you annotate that method because it does something scary, delete everything, for example, like empty all tables. This is something you really want to um, secure in your application. You don't want this to be triggered by accident. And of course, you can argue, why would you not only implement logic that this method has an explicit check uh, somewhere? And this is, of course, fair to do. You probably shouldn't even display this button. But as you all know, bugs happen all of the time. And a good security framework will have several layers of security. Because if you have just one check at some place, then you only have to find a way around this one check and you have basically uh, successfully hacked an application, so a good security f um, measure has several layers such that you have to basically find uh, a path through a chain of, of errors, and method-level security is really a good measure to, to really secure your application. So this is very sensible to do, but how would you do this? How would you write a framework to do that? Annotations, after all, are not processed by the Java Virtual Machine. The Java Virtual Machine actually doesn't care about annotations at all. It doesn't even load the data that represents annotations unless you use them using the Reflection API. But the core engine of the JVM, the runtime, doesn't care about them at all. It actually doesn't even know about annotations and what they are. So annotating a method by itself doesn't do anything. So if you implement a framework, how would you basically implement this check for the logged-in user. And this is the first problem only. The second problem is that if you write a framework, it is supposed to work with your classes. And now let's go back to Spring Security, for example. Um, it is a char file that is delivered by, by its own and doesn't know about your application. So while your service knows about the framework, the framework, of course, doesn't know about your code. And this is a difficult problem to circumvent in Java, where everything is statically typed. You cannot interact with code for the most that you don't know. And only at runtime, you will discover this class that you have to secure. So the, the runtime is the first place in the Java application's lifecycle from writing the code, compiling, and running it, where those two libraries or those two code artifacts interact. And this is why the talk is called runtime code generation. You might have guessed that already. Um, runtime code generation is so popular because it allows you to statically bind um, two code segments that otherwise don't know each other. So, in the end, how would you implement a secured service? In the most trivial case, you would basically just um, inline a check into the method that you are annotating. So, for example, you can have a Maven build tool that scans through all of your code, it finds all methods that are annotated with a certain annotation, and just copy-pastes this code segment up there in the beginning of the method. And this check is, of course, effective, because uh, if you do not have the correct user logged in, this uh, exception will circumvent that the code, the actual code that deletes everything, is ever triggered, because you cannot get past the, end, uh, the, the exception. And this is a sensible approach. You can do this with build time tools, like Maven, as I mentioned, or the Gradle. And you can use Java agents to do these checks. And um, 
especially the build time part is uh, seeing a renaissance. When I gave this talk uh, the last years, I would always jump quickly to this section, which is the more common way of doing code generation today, which is subclassing. You can extend the secured service. Uh, you can extend your service with another um, secured service where all the methods that are annotated are overridden. And by overriding methods, um, you do, of course, change the behavior because it is not possible in Java. Um, it, actually, it is possible, but it's not easily possible in Java to invoke a method that is overridden directly. You have to pass through the overridden um, uh, signature, which is delete everything which has the check. And again, we get the same behavior as before. Now, I said uh, this is how I gave the talk uh, the, the last couple of years. Uh, in our recent times with, uh, for example, the Graal uh, compiler, which is allowing you to generate static um, images of Java applications um, that are co compiled at build time, this second approach, I, I find, sees more and more of its limitations. So people try to offer build time instrumentations um, that, that give you opportunity to do all the instrumentation part already before an application has started. And this is not only because of Graal, it's also because of containerized environments, because you write applications that are supposed to start up quickly. Um, and if you do something at build time, you do it only once, while if you do it at runtime, like with uh, generating a subclass at runtime, uh, what most, most um, libraries do today, you have this overhead at application startup. And traditionally, people didn't really matter, like, didn't really talk so much about startup time. If an application started up in five, six seconds, that was just fine enough. Most applications took much longer, half a minute, minute even, um, old application containers, Tomcats, WebSphere, all these things. But with this failover system where you let just let an Java application crash and then rewipe it once it has crashed, uh, startup time has become more and more um, important, which is why this actual interfering with code uh, at build time has become more popular, as I said. And we'll talk about both. Actually, with my library, at least, this is, of course, what I'm having the biggest focus on. Um, you can write code that does both types of instrumentations, and you basically just configure what you want to do or how you want to apply it. All right. However, just before we get into um, the details of bytecode and code manipulation, I just want to explain to you why the Java Virtual Machine is so spe special in this regard. And many languages do not have runtime code generation, either because they don't have a need for it or because they don't have support for it. And the only reason that we can do runtime code generation on the Java Virtual Machine is that the Java Virtual Machine has an intermediate format, which is Java bytecode, or the class file format, uh, more specifically. All Java platform languages, and even other languages, that are used on the JVM today compile down to bytecode. So if you write a Java program, it can interact with a Scala program, a Groovy program, a, a Kotlin program, um, because the bindings or the binaries that you generate are all in the same format, which is Java bytecode. So this is why you can call a Java class from a Scala class, uh, because in the end they get boiled down to the same representation. And this representation is standardized, it is documented, and it is um, very strict and fairly simple still. So what you can do is you can read this bytecode, uh, or first the JVM takes this bytecode only at runtime and compiles it to machine code um, on demand while the program is executed. And this is the important part. You couldn't uh, manipulate a C program the same way because you would su need support all platforms, all operating systems, all processes. And this is an impossible task to do because you couldn't write a library that was stable enough to support all these environments. And actually, it's a major issue of C. If you ever wrote C++ or C code and you write certain extensions to it and you generate machine code directly, you use ASM in, in, uh, in, in C++, then you're uh, program won't be portable anymore. But if you deliver a library, you don't want this limitation to count. You don't want people on PowerPC to have a different result than people that run your Java program on, on a normal Intel machine, right? So and this is why, why bytecode gives you this great opportunity where you can read a standardized format and you can create a standardized format. So a, a class file in the end is just a file, and the file is just a byte array. And if you manipulate the bytes in a byte array, you get different outcomes. And since this byte array is so well defined and so standardized for all platforms, it's a comparable easy task to do. It's of course not trivial. I mean, bytebuddy is a three megabyte library, um, so it's all but trivial. But it is trivial compared to real um, interaction with, with generic machine code, which is simply not possible. 
A nice thing about writing a Java library that manipulates and, and uh, generates uh, bytecode is that you can actually run this library on the same machine that is um, containing the bytecode. So you can add a library like ByteBuddy or JavaSys or CGLib uh, or ASM um, to your application, and while your application is running, you can manipulate the code that you're about to execute. So you can basically say, we enter this application, and we see the path forward. Now we call this method, now we call that method. Then we make a, a basically a, a turn to the library. The library processes the code that is about to run, sees what's coming, and then manipulates the code that you would have executed to do something else. And you can, of course, do a lot of nonsense with that, but in practice, code generation that way is used a lot to, um, for example, implement the security framework that I just mentioned. You can then say, all right, now we find this, this annotation on the path, and instead of walking just through to this method, what we normally would do, we just inject a small piece of bytecode that applies the check, and uh, that way you can um, do these meta-programming -pro libraries that you otherwise couldn't, right? Okay. Mm. So far for the basics. A lot of people uh, that haven't worked with code generation uh, argue now that Reflection is the way to do these things. Java already has a method and a means to interact with unknown code. You have reflection. Since uh, Java 7, we also have the method handle API, which is doing similar things to reflection, but a bit more efficiently, since it's, it's a typed API, while reflection isn't typed at all. But the problem with reflection is that while it works really well when you want to call into foreign code, because you can generify that in a way, it strips all type safety of your program. And think of if Spring Security, instead of having annotations on your methods, would require you to provide instances of your, your method that you want to secure uh, to, to Spring, then you would basically break your program every time you refactor something, because reflection uh, wouldn't follow up unless you have very good IDE support, but the moment you generify reflection support, uh, you, you lose all type safety of your program, and this is what the API shows you here as well. Uh, the class get declared method, uh, method it takes a string and it takes a, an array of parameter types. The invoke method also takes an object to call something upon and the arguments. If you change the argument types, this reflection might not work anymore and you will only find out at runtime, which is the whole point of the Java programming language that it gives you type safety to the degree that you can reason about your program statically while you compile it and while you program it and not only when you run it. Right? So no, in a means, using reflection uh, strips away the type safety of your Java programs. People also argue that you could just do it yourself. Why right? do all the complexity of adding a code generation library, uh, which is a fairly complex task, why not just paste in the segment? But the nice things about um, declarative programming in this context is that you have a good separation of concerns. You implement your method and you can test your method that way. You can reason about your method uh, that you can say, okay, this is deleting everything. This is the representation of, of this piece of logic. It's not a blend of maybe checking a user, doing some logging, doing some uh, metrics registration. You just mention all these things as an annotation value, which are active while you need it, uh, but it's optional, but during testing you can just focus on the actual code. And I guess you all have tested code bases where there's a lot of separations of concern, uh, where a lot of concerns are merged into one artifact, where you have to set up this big context before you run the test, um, because all these side um, tasks are basically also activated, which makes your testing slow and makes it tedious. And as we all know, programmers don't do tedious things, so your testing will suffer on the long term and tests will, will lack on your code base. On the long run, uh, you deteriorate it uh, to, a, to a quality where you cannot maintain it anymore. And this is why it's, it's very helpful to factor out your things, and, and runtime code generation gives you a good chance of doing so. Right. Also something, if you're in the JavaScript space, uh, runtime code generation isn't such a strange concept. Um, let's say this was JavaScript, right? And if you have used React, for example, you have all your React methods, uh, and, and you call, like, your in, in, in React, for example, you have your get state method, uh, and you would think that this is the method that you have defined somewhere, right? But in JavaScript, since everything is just nominally typed in a way, you, or it's, it's dynamically and nominally typed, you have to delete everything method, but in the end, you do not know what object you 
uh, are invoking this method or bong. So while some framework uh, logic in between can just mimic all the method names that you have defined and intercept it by generating methods or properties with the name that your object also has and intercept it by that. So what runtime code generation practically gives you is the, is the opportunity to implement doc typing in Java. Uh, and only for the segments where you need it, while keeping static uh, typing and, and strict typing uh, and all the rest of your code base, and especially for a user of a library like Spring Security, uh, this is all transparent for you, so you can just program the way you are used to it, and uh, you would have a minimal overhead. So, in a nutshell, this is why, why code generation is so popular in the Java space, and this is why uh, everybody's using it, and in, in effect, like, Spring, for example, uses it to implement a transactional annotation. What is that doing? It overrides your method, opens a transaction at the beginning of the method, calls down to the super method. If an exception is thrown, it rolls back your transaction, and if no exception is thrown, it commits your transaction, and then it closes it again. You can, of course, write this in all methods. You can get your transaction manager, start your transaction, try, catch, finally have your super call, but it is tedious. And if you get it wrong just somewhere because you copy paste it everywhere, uh, then you will have a mistake that is hard to spot and it's hard to debug. And as, as said before in your tests, um, you, will so, uh, you will basically have troubles uh, emulating all this behavior if you don't need it there. Hibernate, obviously. How does Hibernate implement lazy loading for your collection um, properties of your, of your beans, right? Uh, of your entities. It overrides the getter method that returns the collection. Uh, and it returns a lazy collection implementation where only once you call like the get method of the collection, uh, uh, an actual call will be made to the database. And of course, now you can argue that this is a problematic um, feature if you don't understand it. But if you understand it, this is very useful um, because you can just program your beans the way you're used to it. Again, you can use your bean entities in your tests the way you're supp they're supposed to, to, to be used. And only uh, once you use Hibernate, this, in, this behavior is injected. Mukito, it's the same thing. Um, how does Mukito create mocks? It just overrides all methods and does nothing in these methods, unless you specify that something needs to be done. I mean, Mukito, of course, records that the method call was made, but this is the whole magic behind it, and this is how, how it's implemented. Even the OpenJDK is using runtime code generation uh, for implementing Lambda expressions, because Lambda expressions, are, they're very, very boilerplate-y if you implement them. If you think about anonymous classes, um, the, the, a class file is fairly big, uh, compared to what's in a class file. So if you want to keep a Java program small, it's better to basically just ship a descriptor of what class to generate at runtime instead of generating this class file explicitly. Because then um, you only load the, the Lambda expressions that you actually need. Mm, and you might argue, of course, but I have so many Lambda expressions in my application, I use all of them. But think about the, the 50 libraries that you have on your class path that have so many code segments that you never use, and all these Lambda expressions that you never trigger, they will never be loaded. So those, those will not use space, neither on your disk or in your memory. And it's a very worthy optimization um, compared to the anonymous classes um, um, abstraction that we had before. And this is also one of the reasons that was made that way. Not only that you can potentially change the representation in the future, also to, to strip down the size of your artifacts significantly. All right, so now we're almost ready to go into uh, the code generation part where I show you how to do code generation. But before that, I just, I'm, I'm trying to educate everybody about this. Don't use code generation because someone tells you it helps you with performance. And I still see that, and there's tool outs in the wild that actually sell you solutions for bytecode optimizers. Mm. So, for example, a typical thing that you would want to optimize, you have this method that um, multiplies this constant with another constant. And since the constant is, is constant, of course you want to fold the constant. So you think you could use bytecode manipulation to copy the value that you reference to the, the call side where you multiply it and you basically save yourself a dereference. And this is a tight loop and you think, all right, I, I'll, I'll, um, I'll, I'll do that. The same goes for reflection. A lot of people tell you reflection is slower than code generation. And that's not true. Like, CGLib has all these fast class utilities. Uh, the truth is that the JVM had for years a, a code generator built in where reflective access is replaced with code generated. Uh, and it does that fairly well. So you don't have to do that yourself. You can actually control it by setting the sun reflect inflation threshold property which is 10 by default. So once you call the method 10 times by reflection, it typically is optimized in a way 
that um, it is just as if you had called the method using non-reflective access. There's, of course, corner cases, especially related to object allocation, where you might have a performance penalty with reflection, but it's not about the code generation part here. It's about the generic, gener, gener, genericity of the call that you have on your call side, which makes it hard for the JIT to optimize. But always keep that in mind. The JVM already has a very powerful code, genera uh, code generator built in, which is the Java JIT compiler. The JIT compiler generates machine code, and it does that much, much more efficiently. Java C, Scala C, the Kotlin compiler, all these compilers, they're not about performance at all. And this is what makes developing a language for the JVM comparably easy. You only have to create a representation of your program. You don't have to optimize it. You don't have to constant fold. You don't have to inline. All these things are done at runtime by the Java virtual machine, and they're based on the profile of your application's execution. So don't try to outsmart the JIT compiler. The JIT compiler typically knows what it's doing, and it knows it much better than, than we would do manually, um, since it has all the runtime information about how your program is executed that you do not necessarily have when you optimize manually. right? So keep that in mind, especially once you understand how the tooling works for code generation. Don't try to, to build this hyper-performance uh, framework using code generation. You always go down a wrong path doing so. Right. So what is Java bytecode? I mean, obviously, it has something with bytes to do. But the more typical representation of, of code in Java is by using um, yeah, names for, for all bytecodes. So if you want to add the methods 1 plus 2, uh, the, the numbers one and two, then the JVM has an abstraction uh, which is a stack machine. So any instruction in the, in the Java virtual machine operates on an operand stack. So one plus two is basically um, pushing values onto a stack and then popping it off the stack again. So the iconst one instruction pushes the value one onto the stack. The iconst two instruction pushes the value two onto the stack. And the I add instruction again pops the two top values off the stack, sums them up, and pushes the, the result value back from it. Now, we're still lacking the last instruction in this method, which is the return instruction. The I return pops the top value of the operand stack and returns it to the caller method. And this is basically how all Java programs work. But keep in mind that this is only an a, a representation of how the machine works. As I mentioned many times now, the JIT compiler of the Java Virtual Machine will, of course, optimize this program and represent it as something that your particular CPU understands best. And as of today, not many CPUs work as stack machines anymore. They are register machines. For example, my computer here is, is just an Intel PC, um, an Intel Core, um, and it is, of course, register-based. So the Java Virtual Machine will, at runtime, compile the stack code um, to a register uh, access pattern and, and basically align it with what the machine executes. And the re only reason that this metaphor was chosen, and, and I call it that because it is that, a metaphor, is that stack uh, machine languages always have implicit target offsets. It always references the top of the stack and not a certain register name, right? And when Java was born in the early years of the internet, or not, not the early years, but where applets and so forth got popular, a big and important um, target of the Java bytecode format was to be small and compact because you would send it over the internet. You would load your applet in the browser, right? So the artifact that you would send should be as small as possible. And since stack-based languages are so much smaller than register-based languages, uh, this was the, the, the more uh, suitable abstraction. And this was therefore chosen. But to, as of today, it has nothing to do with how machines work. Uh, however, it, it turned out to be uh, fairly robust, and, and it's difficult to change that now anyways. So I think we will be stuck with that. But I don't think it's a bad thing either. Especially considering that, that like, like the Graal native compiler or the Graal AOT compiler that are now the, the AOT part is already in the in the JDK now since nine I think um, uh, allow you to basically do this transformation before you even start your program and also actually Android choose a different JVM bytecode format the, the, the Dalvik executable format because Android is is running with so limited resources that this transformation was considered so costly that they defined their own format which is register based since most phones um, of course also run um, register based CPUs and and 
despite it's not that that it takes so much time to transform that at runtime all of the time, but it costs electricity. So and then your your phone would be empty much much faster, and you want to avoid that. This is why the whole Android ecosystem is so little compatible with the rest of the Java ecosystem. It's because all the bytecode manipulation frameworks consider and assume this format that I'm showing you here, and cannot work with this very different format um, that Android has. And then a second aspect, I mean, ByteBody supports Android to a degree, um, but it's a pain to work with anything that Google makes because they change it all the time and they, they don't have any sense of backwards compatibility. So you're always on your toes and then it's a struggle. So, so uh, that's the other aspect of it. So why it's called Java Bytecode, um, it's because all these instructions are represented as a single byte in your program. So if the Java Virtual Machine parses your methods, it will be provided these four bytes, the byte 4, the byte 5, the, the byte 6C, and the byte AC. Um, and it will know by the Java um, Virtual Machine specification that these byte codes, these bytes, mean the things that we just talked about. So if you compile a Java class that contains this method, 1 plus 2 return, and you open the class file, in a hex editor, you would find these four bytes in a row somewhere, and this would be the method representation. And then if you look up the Java Virtual Machine specification where the class file format is described, you would see how there's like a header in the file, and then there's a table of all methods, and then these, these tables point to offsets in the class file where you have the method name, the method signature, and so forth, and also the implementation, the bytecode, right? I just need to mention, because I tell this to people, and then they try it out, and they will see that it won't work. Actually, the Java C compiler does one optimization, which is folding off literal constants. <laughs> so 1 plus 2 will be 3 already in Java C, but you can deactivate that. And it's just the simplest example you can do. But, but in theory, that's how it works, despite the small exception, right? Right. So how can you generate bytecode? Now we has, have established that a class file is basically just a class ar a byte array where all the things are at specific points in, in the method. And knowing that, you can, of course, find the offset where the method code is, right? And you can extend this, this segment to, to contain more bytes. So considering the security check that we had in the beginning of the talk, all you would need to do is you would have to figure out what the bytecode is for this if um, throw statement and you would just put it in there in the beginning of the method and then just re retain the original bytecode right after there, right? And in practice, <laughs> this is what code generation do, does. That's what ByteBody does, that's what uh, CGLib does, what JavaSys does, and so forth. The more um, direct means of achieving that is to use ASM, which is, I'd say, the code generation um, parser library that, that is there on the, on the JVM. There are two in theory. There's uh, ASM and there's BCEL from Apache, but uh, BCEL is not catching up quickly enough and even OpenJDK is using ASM. And ASM has a simple visitor API where you basically you say create a method, you, you first you get the class file, the byte array, the actual byte array, then you get a class visitor that reads this byte array and then you say I want to change this method and you will get a method visitor back, and then you can basically determine what the method implementation will be. And you can just say, uh, visit iconst1, visit iconst2, I add, I return, and you implement it 1 plus 2. Right? You have, to, of course, to know that. There's a tree API and there's a visitor API for that, but most people use the visitor API because it's just much more performant. And that's easy to try out, actually. You can create your own class files, and you can emulate what the Java compiler is doing. You can, in theory, just uh, use like a, uh, a Java compiler and, and get the abstract syntax tree out and try to compile it yourself. It's, you, if you try that once, it's like, it sounds like a dumb exercise, but you'll see how straightforward the Java virtual machine um, specification actually is and how simple things are. And thanks to the simplicity, code generation libraries work so stably. Right, and it's great with ASM because it gives you full freedom, but once you introduce ASM in your projects, um, you will have to have a team that understands the stack metaphor, this, and understands the JVM type system, because surprise, the JVM's type system is unequal to the Java type system. For example, the JVM doesn't know about Booleans. Booleans don't exist as a type in, in the JVM. Uh, they exist as a signature, but they don't exist as a type in the JVM. Everything is an integer. 
So shorts are integers, bytes are integers, chars are integers, booleans are integers, and integers are integers, obviously. Unless they're in an array, then there's a different notation, but even for arrays, booleans don't exist, at least. Uh, there's a lot of maintenance work that you need to do. ASM requires you to compute stack sizes for the operand stack. Um, you have to do some things in Java 6 that is called stack map frame uh, computation, which is expensive and tedious, which is just optimizations and, and their ground keepers work you want to avoid. Uh, ironically, byte uh, code level IPS are not type safe at all. So if you, for example, have the I return statement just a few, few times, a few lines too high up, you will not get an error at all. You will just return too early with the value that's on the top of the stack. Uh, you might not even notice that. So um, there's, there's really a lot of things that can go wrong. And that's why I don't typically recommend people to use ASM unless you have a need for it that is really a low level. And this is why I created ByteBuddy to begin with. So ByteBuddy, I started out um, in 2014. So, well, yeah, f five years ago almost. And uh, it grew from a small project. I was back then fairly active in open source already. And I encountered CGLib a lot of times. So I started maintaining CGLib, if you have seen that. But CGLib, um, it's an old library in its defense. It's, it's been written in the times of Java 1.1. And it shows, because there's no generics, there's a lot of weird things, synchronization blocks, there's racing conditions, deadlock potential. And if you know all that, you can use CGLib fairly well. But the, the code base of CGLib is a mess. The performance of the generated code is rather mediocre. And I, tr I thought back in the days, sure, I'll, I'll, I'll spend a weekend and I'll write something better. And here I stand four years later, and um, I'm still doing, doing things in ByteBuddy that I thought I would have been done uh, doing just a long while back. But um, uh, I just checked the download numbers this morning because it's a new month and I got new numbers. It's up to 20 million downloads a month now, so you can see how fast, fast spread this is. And, and of course, that gives you also a lot of feedback, well, it gives me a lot of feedback to cover corner cases that I otherwise wouldn't even have known on. And I think it's a, it's a very stable uh, API and library by now, and you can use it uh, to avoid dealing with bytecode yourself. Uh, but that said, of course, you should try out ASM because you just want to understand how the JVM works to at least a, a superficial degree because understanding bytecode in a, in a general level, especially once you have multiple languages on the class path, if you use Scala and Kotlin and, and Java here and there, it can help you to understand certain behaviors um, if you understand how bytecode in general interacts with each other because this is the level on what these languages do interact, as a matter of fact, right? So a simple example with ByteBuddy, uh, we create an instance of ByteBuddy, we subclass object, we take the method that is named toString, where there's only one at this point, so this is a safe matching, and we return the value hello world. We make the class, we load the class, and we get the loaded class, and here we are in the reflection API. And now we can say dynamic type, new instance, toString, returns hello world, because that's all it does, right? Uh, it's that easy, but it's also too easy. It doesn't really help you to do that thing. Um, so, as a second step, instead of using the value um, interception, we use the method delegation to interception. And method delegation basically allows you to name a different class, and ByteBuddy will then introspect this class and find a best static method to delegate to. Now we return hello world, but now we do it uh, programmatically. So ByteBuddy will basically generate a subclass of object where the toString method is overridden to invoke my interceptor intercept, right, and return the result. And you can now set a breakpoint in this, this interceptor class, and uh, it will trigger once you invoke the toString method. And from there, basically, it's, it's straightforward. You can now inject parameters. For example, you can annotate the origin um, annotation and get the method. And now this will print hello world from toString. Right, uh, and, and basically this is how it works. You have, I think now, up to 20 annotations that you can use to get all sort of things. You can get a callback to the original method that you have overridden. You can get the arguments, of course. You can get um, the name of the method um, with the origin parameter and, and all sorts of things. Um, that this instance that you um, intercepted uh, and all these things, right? Uh, and this is how, how you do code generation. You don't have to worry about bytecode at all anymore. All the ASM part that I talked about will now be handled transparently by, by ByteBuddy. A nice aspect of this is that it's very little intrusive. Uh, most code generation libraries that exist today require you to implement interceptors by implementing a class of a certain interface. 
and this is, has worked nicely for many years, and um, it doesn't anymore. And the reason for that is the Java module system. And uh, you might already guess what the problem is. If you have an interface um, that is the dispatcher, then this interface type will be written into the proxy class that you would generate. And if the proxy is loaded by a module that doesn't know about code generation, and for example, if you use Spring Security, you do not know that all this happens necessarily, but you would need to declare an explicit dependency from your proxied module to the proxying module for this to work. And this is why proxying had quite a struggle with Java 9 and onwards. And we don't feel the effects yet, because nobody uses modules, really. Um, but once you do, you will suddenly get uh, errors at runtime where, you, uh, where, where the JVM tells you that you do not import cglib, for example. You do not read cglib, and therefore you cannot use cglib types. But it is because the proxies that were generated depend on cglib, um, and this code isn't written by you, it is written of a framework that not, doesn't necessarily understand the module system. This is why Java 9 was painfully uh, much work for me as well, because I had to change a lot of things, because these boundaries are very clear now, and they weren't before. Before, as I said in the beginning, at runtime, all jars were just on the class path. And there they were basically as if they were uh, on the same, in the same code artifact. There were no boundaries between jar files, but now there are very strict boundaries between jar files. Uh, the nice thing about annotations, and originally I designed this because the limitation of cglib also was that it didn't work with OSGI properly, is that annotations, if they are not loadable by a module, they are ignored. Uh, an annotation, if it's missing on the class path at runtime, it's just not there. And this is the, the contract that the JVM has with the, the annotation um, um, specification. It says if you cannot find a, an annotation class, it is, is suppressed. Right? So this is why this approach still works uh, with Java 9 and onwards. There were other issues that I had to figure out, but especially this part works out. And then I, I wrote a blog post about this. I don't think that these other libraries can survive in the long run with this explicit type dependency in the proxy. Right. So as mentioned, there are a bunch of annotations, but I won't go too deep into that. You can figure it out by yourself. There's a lot of uh, documentation if you're really interested on the web page as well, and the Java doc, obviously. Great. So now we've learned how to do subclassing. In the beginning, I showed you that build time instrumentation and agent instrumentation are other means of achieving this goal. And this is always a popular one. <laughs> um, the JVM supports um, a feature that's called HotSwap, and HotSwap allows you to exchange method code at runtime. So let's say you have a class foo and a method bar that just returns bar. And uh, you have code that says foo is new foo, and then they invoke bar, and of course you expect it to return bar. Unless you run this code. ByteBuddy can redefine a class, so basically it goes into the foo class, it takes the method bar, intercepts the value, and returns hello world. And now you use a class reloading strategy, that is based on a Java agent. And in this case, you just have to call class reloading strategy installed agent, and you will get the agent um, um, without you doing any, any much work there. And as a result, ByteBuddy will transform the already loaded class and change the method to return bar, uh, hello world instead of bar. And that's a great way to piss off anybody you're working with, because that's not very, very debuggable, as you might understand it. Because if you put a breakpoint into the method, you will see that bar is returned. And if you step out of the method, you will see it's hello world, actually. Mm. And, and of course, this is nonsense, right? This doesn't make any sense. But again, think back of the, um, of the security example, um, then it does suddenly make sense because you can then suddenly at runtime just inject that, um, that security check into the method and then return um, the, the original method value. Uh, it's, you can also use it to, for example, inject a timer. You can take the time at the beginning of the method, run the original code, and then you print the time it took to run the code on the console. Right? Simple thing. Uh, actually, and that's, it has actual use cases. If you know the, the Eron library, the high performance library, they, they do that um, to inject logging into the application because uh, Eron is, is a very, very high tuned library. So they, it's um, Martin Thompson, if you know that guy, um, he, he's very into how the JVM compiles bytecode to machine code. And he writes a lot of ugly code, you can say, to make the JVM do certain things that he expects it to do. And if you add logging, you break all that, right? 
So if you add logging, the JVM will apply different optimizations, and for the most, it's not important. But if you have like a trading system where microsecond uh, performance is important, then you will have to do yeah, ugly things to get what you want. And then logging is in the way, but you still want logging. So what Erin offers is that you can use this approach, basically, to only activate logging when you really need it without it having to be there on the, on, in the code base. So typically, it is if a, if a server turns sour, it crashed after weeks of running well, and you want to know why, what happened. You have some off-heap uh, allocation that go wrong, and you want to just um, yeah, explore what the state is, then you can just go into the application. You can actually do this from the outside, inject this logging into the application and get the, the information out of it without restarting it even. Um, and without agents, you couldn't do that. right? Um, a more typical approach to achieve that, instead of using the direct way of doing that, uh, is to use a Java agent to implement one directly. And if you have never done that, that might uh, look strange, the pre-main part here. But Java Virtual Machine defines three different ent entry points to a program. Main is the, the public static void main, you all know that, that's the official entry point. But there's also public static void pre-main. And pre-main is a program that you run before your actual program. And you specify it on the command line, doing minus Java agent, and then the jar file. And then it's basically as if you added that to the class path, only that this pre-main method is also executed. And the pre-main method gets a, a very interesting uh, instance as a second argument, which is instrumentation. And instrumentation allows you to intercept any class loading uh, of an application, and ByteBuddy uh, allows you to make very simple use of that. So, so you can set an agent builder, and you want to you say all types named foo. You want to intercept the method bar and inter return hello world from that method, and then you install it on the instrumentation that the, the pre-main method provides you, and then you will get the same result. Again, this is of course a nonsensical example, but it is it's there to to make it simple to understand, not to be practically of practical use. Um, you can use that to, for example, I know people who do this to um, inject Prometheus um, um, extraction into an application. Because it's a huge code base, it would be tedious and, and, and um, a lot of work to find all the, the classes that end with service, and then you have to find all the methods um, to, to add the Prometheus part of it, right? You don't want to change the code base, so instead of you, you define an agent where you say all types that end with service that are in a certain package, uh, on the method, if the method is public, we uh, log the runtime of the method to Prometheus. And this is then typically 50 lines of code in ByteBuddy and, and an agent, and you put it just on and it works without you ha even having to recompile this huge application that, that's maybe legacy from 10 years ago. And also, like, if you run your application in Java, Java 8 JDK, but it, the code base is still Java 5, then you can inject this Java 8 part into it without breaking the original build. All right, um, I have 12 minutes left, so let me just jump into a few things and um, what's interesting. R right, uh, I talked a lot about logging time, and um, ByteBuddy is a component that's called advice, and advice is, is basically allowing you to add code to the beginning of a method and to the end of a method. And it works very similar to method delegation with the difference that if you instrument a class, then ByteBuddy will take the advice method code and use it as a template that is then copied over to the original code. So with advice, basically you say on method enter, you want to call system nanotime, then ByteBuddy copy paste this line into the beginning of the method. It won't return it, but it will store the return value in the local variable. At the end of the method, it does then the same thing for the exit part. It stores the result of the original call um, for a short while and returns it, and then it basically, before returning, it, it copy-pastes this other code in there. And all the annotated parameters are um, basically just copied over. The nice thing of this approach is that this has literally zero performance overhead, because the JIT compiler um, is seeing this method and it crunches it pretty efficiently. And then the result is as if you had written this code directly. And this is a, a bit of an argument sometimes against code generation libraries, um, that they, they add real um, uh, overhead and real barriers into your application. But this approach is primarily also usable when you deal with the Java module system again. Because now you copy-pasted the code literally, 
uh, over, now this module that you have instrumented has zero dependencies or zero knowledge of your your dispatcher code. You don't have this, this dispatcher anymore where you do your stuff, so you don't have to adjust the module graph to this new uh, part. You can just uh, run your code as expected, and you have zero influence from your agent on this modularized application. Right? And you can just trigger that from an agent, and again, now it's a more useful example. We have foo, we want to measure the runtime of foo, which maybe isn't so useful in the end, but um, um, let's say that the computation of, of the string bar takes a lot of time. This is all the code it needs, and it will print foo bar took yeah, 16,030 nanoseconds, right? Uh, 1,630 nanoseconds. And I challenge you, this is actually running code. You copy this segment down there, uh, you put it into a class, and you specify this, the program's Java agent, and it'll work, right? Um, this is actually an agent main method. I mentioned three entry points before. I said pre-main and main. Agent main is the third uh, entry point. Um, agent main means that you can actually also attach an agent while an application is already running. There's an attach API um, in the JDK that allows you to basically hook into any running JVM. This is how, for example, JStack works and all these toolings that are bundled with the JDK. They need a means to communicate with the running JVM process. And um, there's a port. Any JVM opens a, not, not a port, a uh, has a file where you basically, um, you, the file specifies a port where you can start listening and JVM will connect with your JDK and give you up this information. ByteBuddy has a very convenient API for that uh, to handle. Um, it's the basically install agent part that I showed you before. But So basically you can go into your, your application, you wonder why it's slow, you don't want to restart it, maybe you cannot restart it, you can still uh, use, it, use this little bit of code to inject your logging for, for um, basically printing out uh, how long it something takes, and it might help you to debug a process that has been running for weeks that you don't have to shut on. Uh, you, as said, you can do this using retransformation, and, and by doing that, even already loaded classes can be transformed, and with that advice, that's fairly simple. All right. The last part for today, um, before I'm done, is uh, talking about build time instrumentation, because this is coming more and more. I see also the library developers are discovering it. Hibernate has, for example, had it for a long time. Uh, Hibernate has a Maven plugin, and I think also a Gradle plugin, that allows you to generate all the proxying logic already at build time. And as a result, at runtime, you will not have to generate classes anymore. Because class generation is actually quite expensive, um, because you have to load these classes dynamically, and there's a lot of struggle with unsafe APIs and um, the, the new Java 9 related APIs, which are also fairly uh, overheadish. So the easiest part is to include these proxy classes in your original artifacts, and you don't have to worry about it at all. So if you can do that at build time, great. And um, I think the, the biggest reason that this is not better adapted today is convenience. Um, people don't want to change their build. It's much easier to drop a, a library in the class path and you're done with it. But um, I think this is going to be a big topic in the next years. Uh, I see Spring also starting to do it with the Spring Foo project. They try to go away from runtime introspection and have more explicit um, um, means of, of creating proxies and creating um, runtime configurations from, from, from annotations, for example. And uh, ByteBuddy, of course, offer, I mean, I'm in the, in the business of code generating, so obviously I have an API for that as well. Basically, you implement a plugin API, you specify what types you want to instrument, and then you say um, how you want to instrument them. Again, we take the, the method bar and return hello world. Um, you know the drill by now, right? And all you need to do then is to have a ByteBuddy Maven plugin uh, put into your class file, and you specify what plugin you want to run. And during build time, ByteBuddy will scan your entire classes folder, find all classes named foo here, whoops, and apply this instrumentation for you. If XML is too verbose for you and you want to use Gradle, you see here there's almost the same amount of code, but you can, of course, do it in Gradle the same way. You specify where your uh, transformer class lives, and then you apply it at runtime. Right, And um, the, the, the nice thing about it, and this is, I think, where the, the future will move forwards to, if you see all this API here, these parts, uh, the instrumentation code is actually identical for the agent, for the subclassing, and for the build time plugin. So the idea of, of ByteBuddy also is that you only have to write the instrumentation once, and then you can choose what way of instrumentation you want to apply. Because build time instrumentation, while it is more efficient for an application that is restarted a lot, 
Um, it is less efficient for an application that you build every time you run it because you're, for example, running unit tests dynamically from your app. If you have a big application and your build suddenly takes forever because you have to generate 50 proxy classes on every build run, then unit testing will suddenly slow down. So I think that the future will always have like a, a space for a hybrid approach where, for example, for testing and all these things, you generate your proxies dynamically at runtime because that's the, the fastest and easiest way to do it because you only have to generate the proxies that they actually need. While if you write integration tests, for example, um, you, uh, or, or run it in production, you actually want to run your full build and then you might want to do this part in the build time. Uh, and as I said, Hibernate is already there. I think Spring will move there as well. There's other libraries that, that have moved completely over to build time um, instrumentation like um, Micronaut. Uh, and, and this, of course, increases your startup times by a lot um, because all this work that is now done um, at runtime will move to build time. And there's also an interesting aspect in it because when people reason about performance, and I mean, I do a lot of performance talks myself, uh, and all these talks, I always talk about hot code optimizations. How will your code that is run in a loop 10,000 times a second, uh, how will that code behave? Because you have the trading system and so forth, and you want this to work perfectly, right? All these configuration parts, class generation and so forth, typically is only executed once at application startup. And this means it's not hot code. It's not jitted. It's not optimized. It is run by the interpreter. An interpreter code works fine, but it is also fairly slow. Um, because it's not, it's not a compiled language, right? And then the interpreter has to step through every instruction as they are in the bytecode. And, and of course, uh, since you only write, write this once, this is the best way to do it because optimizing all this code for con generation takes all too long time. So instead, um, you are um, yeah, running the slow path. And, and running the slow path is, of course, then very costly compared to the same code if it was run in a hot loop. And I, I'm guilty of this myself. I benchmarked ByteBuddy, obviously. Uh, I benchmark it a lot, but I benchmark it in the hot path. I, I pretend that someone's generating millions of classes in your application because generally all, all tooling is built for that as well. I wouldn't even know if there's an interpreter-oriented uh, tooling for, for benchmarking performance. And this is why it is so good for performance and startup time to move all this code generation to build time since you're running in the slow path, making this extraordinarily slow to do. Right. Right, plugin code here and there. So where I want with that as well? Why do I tell you all these approaches? Uh, <laughs> I think that a lot of things that you do in frameworks today can be done with Java agents, especially in the logging and monitoring space, uh, like I said, for, for injecting Prometheus metrics and so forth. Uh, what decouples your code a bit from frameworks, uh, today's Java space is always you have this, this bean container, you get everything out of there and to even get tiny details proxied, you just want to have this logging annotation to work on this class. And for that, you have to make it a prototype bean, but it would be much more convenient for your code base to not have this particular instance as a bean, uh, since it's not really managed. It's just you want this, this AOP mechanism to work for it. And this space, I think, like libraries like ByteBuddy can do a better job um, if you just have your annotations and you have your small little build plugin and you apply it on your code base and you get this all working um, in any scope, right? And you can do the instrumentation after you run, you run your tests, for example, so it doesn't apply to them, um, and you can manage all these things. So, so food for thought for you. Um, try it out and see what you can get, get done with it. Um, I'm almost out of time, so I won't tell you how Android is making my life miserable. Um, I can only show you the performance quickly. Um, ByteBuddy is doing fairly well. ByteBuddy, to be honest, is a bit more costly at uh, generation time than the alternatives like JavaSyst and CGLib. Um, not in all contexts, but what I'm mainly aiming for is the runtime. So once you have generated a class, if you compare ByteBuddy's performance to the baseline, it's as if you didn't do it. It's like if the code was just in your method as you originally intended, because for the most, that's what ByteBuddy is doing. There's no indirection between ByteBuddy, your code, and your framework. ByteBuddy just connects your framework and your code directly and removes all the boxing, removes all the, um, the indirection, as I said, and as a result, the JIT compiler will just remove the, the last bit as well. So as a result, typically, ByteBuddy achieves uh, zero overhead. Uh, once you have the classes generated. And, and of course, for that, I have to, to have, do a trade-off. Either you spend a lot of time generating quality code, but if you do that, then 
um, you will get a payout at runtime once you have once you execute the code you have generated. Before CGLib and JavaSys, they often take like the easy approach. Doing the easy way takes less time, but it generates more sloppy code, right? All right, and now I'm filling up the minutes. So you can find me on Twitter if you're interested in these topics. I'm doing a lot of modularization the last years. It came naturally to me. I didn't choose it. It just broke a lot of my code, so I had to dig in deep. But uh, now I enjoy it a lot, and I tweet a bit about that. I tweet about code generation. Otherwise, check out ByteBuddy on GitHub, on ByteBuddy.net. And I have a second library that I don't promote that much anymore. Documents4j is like a binding for Microsoft Word into Java. If you ever have customers that need word interaction and PDF generation from it, it might be interesting for you. Thank you so much for coming. I'll be around all day, so please just find me and talk to me if you have any questions. Um, thank you.